<laughs> You're listening to the Hour of the Time. I'm William Cooper. Tonight, folks, you may experience a little static on the line. It's raining here, and the lines are wet, and we have GTE, which is the absolute worst phone company in the entire United States of America. I think they're still using 1930s equipment or something, but every time anything gets wet around here, all the phones go crazy. Tonight, we are supposed to have a special guest calling in, and I'm going to tell you right now, it's uh, Linda Thompson. And uh, we've got an awful lot to talk about. Now, I don't know if Linda realizes uh, that we're having some phone problems, and I don't know if she understands which lines she's supposed to call in on because it's been uh, quite a while since she's been a guest on this show. Uh, she used to know to call in on 2174. So if there's anybody out there listening who has Linda Thompson's phone number, either office or home or both, please call her and ask her to call in on the call-in line 602-333-2174. That's 602-333-2174. When we talk this afternoon, because she's been on the show several times and has always used that line, I assumed uh, that she would remember the number and call in on that number, uh, but I think she's probably trying to call in on the number that we're linked up to the satellite on, so uh, <laughs> I don't know if this is going to work or not. But if there's anybody out there listening who knows Linda Thompson's home number and or her office number, please call her and ask her to call in on 602-333-2174. And uh, we're going to give a lead in that uh, we'd already picked out for her. If she doesn't show up, we've got lots of other things to talk about. So that's okay. And uh, that might be her right there. Let me check it out. Well, well, we'll do the lead-in, and if that's her, if that's you on the line, Linda, and it's not because whoever it is just hung up. <laughs> anyway, we'll do the lead-in and see if she calls. Well, we're going to try it. Uh, hello. Hello? Is that you, Linda? Oh, I can barely hear you. You can. Well... And you don't sound like yourself. The line is blocked. I had to go through the operator. I'm going to try again. Okay. Oh, now you're in. You're and in clear. Is that okay now? Yeah, what'd you do? I didn't do anything. Oh, now you're not clear. I <laughs> well, tried dialing it again. I had to go through the operator to get through. What we've got here is General Telephone and Electric Company, GTE. Uh, you're in clear again. I don't know what the deal is. Well, it's GTE. Their phones are like prehistoric. Huh. And the company really, frankly, my dear, doesn't give a damn. Uh, that's what we got to put up with here. Plus, it's raining outside, and GTE doesn't know how to insulate their lines, so nothing works with GTE when it rains. <laughs> oh, how wonderful. Well, when I first tried to call through, I kept getting busy, and I went through the operator, and it would ring and hang up. So, 15 tries, and here we are. Well, at least you got through. That's oh, a I want you to know a whole bunch of people called on the other lines to let me know you were <laughs> trying to get me. That's good. Wonderful. Okay, Linda, there's a lot of controversy raging right now about your film, uh, Waco, The Big Lie. Well, uh, most of it coming from three individuals, one Tom Donahue, uh, one Bobo Gritz, an another one uh, Ken Fawcett, who, by the way, said on this show, came on this show and made a statement that what he saw at the end of that uh, tank was uh, flame. Oh, you mean now he's saying it's not? Now he's saying that it, it's some kind of uh, insulation material. Oh, that's <coughs> the same story all the feds are saying. Okay, well, now we know who's who, don't we? Right. Um, <laughs> all right, well, it's not insulation material. They've apparently come up with a uh, piece of tape from CNN, the bastion of uh, integrity that they are, and claim that that's the same footage as I have, and I, they, they're claiming that I cut mine off early, and that if I had let it play another few seconds, you could tell that it was insulation material. Well, I got the piece of footage that they're claiming is the same thing. First of all, it's not the same scene. It's not shot by the same camera, and it isn't the same time that the tank went in and out of the hole. Second of all, even their piece of footage does show flame at the beginning, and yeah, there is junk on the tank, and it's not as clear as the piece of footage I have, but again, it's still the flame-throwing tank, it is still throwing flame. Not only that, I've gotten more footage from a satellite feed, a guy that taped it off satellite, that shows the same tank at the front door, you can see it shooting flames very, very plainly, 
and at the corner of the house where it shoots flames again. So we've probably got, plus it's also got the um, same scene as my tank, ha uh, my tape has, only from a different camera angle. So it completely corroborates what's in Waco the Big Lie and has additional footage. So we're going to make an update tape and put this footage out because there is no way in this world that they can cover the rest of the times that this flamethrowing tank has been captured on videotape. Every expert that has analyzed my first tape, including Department of Justice's own experts, have said that they absolutely, even just, well, Justice Department said they don't know. They won't say what they think it is. They said it appears to be flames, but they don't know. <coughs> now, they couldn't even get their own expert to lie and say it wasn't flames, and you know if they could, they would. <laughs> We've had an FBI forensic fellow look at this, and umpteen TV stations have analyzed the tape. It's not monkeyed with. It is flames. And now we've got even more proof, and we just got them by the yin yang. That's all there is to it. We've got them. Uh, you know, I've got to correct something. I said that it's Tom Donahue, and, and uh, that's not correct. And I don't want to, I don't know Tom Donahue, don't know anything about him. Um, but that's not correct. It was the Tom Donahue show, but it was Ron Engelman who was making these statements. Uh, it was, uh, so let me correct that right now. It oh, was not Tom Donahue. It was Ron Engelman. I Engel will leave Tom Donahue in there, and I'll tell you why, Bill. Uh, Thursday, two weeks ago, I got some phone calls from people that were at a radio station in South Bend. They had received a fax from Ron Engelman that said he had absolute proof that the flamethrowing tank in my tape was not plain. Okay? That's what the fax said. Now, this was on Thursday. That same Thursday, Tom Donahue announced on his program that the following Tuesday, Ron Engelman was going to be hosting his show, Donahue's show, and that he was going to have distressing news about the Waco tape. That was the show I'm talking about. Uh, Ron, Ron yeah, Engelman Tom was... made the announcement. Now, I called up Tom when I found out, you know, what, this, what was going on with the facts that Engelman was claiming to have proof that the flames weren't real, because I, I smelled a rat, frankly. And I called up Tom Donahue, and I got a return. I got his answering machine, and Ron Engelman returned the phone call, not Tom Donahue. Uh -huh. And I asked Ron Engelman what was this uh, distressing news going to be, and he said, "Well, that's just not flames on your tank." And I said, "Well, how do you know?" And he says, "Well, if he's going to have an expert analyze it, and he was going to have it. Uh, he had another piece of tape that was going to prove that it wasn't." And I said, "Well, who's your expert?" And he says, well, I don't know. Some other guys are setting it up for me. And I said, you mean you haven't even had it looked at yet? And you're claiming you have proof that it's not real? And he said, yes, that was, he had not looked at it. He had, he had not had it analyzed. And I said, well, what does this piece of footage show that you claim that, that you've got? He says, well, I haven't seen it yet. So here they're already making a claim on Thursday that they're going to claim on Tuesday that the tape footage is not genuine, but they haven't done anything to analyze it or anything. So basically what they were doing was lying. It was absolute fraud. And I sent a letter to the president of that radio station that Donahue's on, and I talked to the president and the guy that said he was the vice president about this, and I said that Ron Engelman had just admitted to me on Thursday night that, the, that his announcement on Tuesday was a fraud, that he had not analyzed the tape, that he had not looked at any tape from anybody else, but he was still going to go ahead and announce that it was not uh, flames in my tape. I said, this, you know, this is ridiculous. And I sent them a letter to that effect and said that if they did that, I was going to sue them. And they went ahead and did it because apparently Tuesday they made that announcement. Well, so well, I, I just hope that they're prepared to back it up in court. I know they're not. And that's the only option I have left at this point because they did this for publicity, I think. Is the only explanation I could come up with for it. Well, I, I doubt but it. Now we've got additional footage, and it absolutely, positively has them locked in. There's no way they can avoid six different scenes of this tank with the flame coming out of it. Now, are these all different angles? Yeah, all different angles. Well, if they're different angles, it can't possibly be a reflection off of something. No way. So. There is no way. <laughs> and besides that, even on the, just the piece that I had when we made the first Waco tape, uh, a Boy Scout can look at that and see it's fire. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure it out. And well, the, the truth is, is, when I watch that tape, it sure looks like fire uh, to me. Uh, every time I see it, it looks like fire to me. And uh, I have a degree in photography. I've analyzed, uh, I've made many different video documentaries. I know how video cameras work. 
Um, I, I can't see how anybody could say that, the, that that's uh, a reflection off of something and be able to prove it. At this point in time, there's thousands of people that have this tape. We've had dozens of TV stations analyze the tape. We've had everybody walk it through frame by frame, and there's not a single person out of all those thousands of people that have made that claim except people that we know are government operatives or opportunists. And, I mean, we're talking six people out of the whole country at the most, are making this claim, and they started off claiming it was insulation until I pointed out to them that the house had no insulation. And so they changed it. Now they're claiming it's a reflection, or they're claiming it's an orange curtain. Now, I think those two things are the most absurd claims I've heard yet, because first of all, if you look at uh, where the sun was at that time of day, it could not be reflecting from there. And secondly, orange curtains don't glow. Well, you know. I, I haven't seen one that glows yet, but the, you know, I haven't seen everything. But uh, thirdly, that doesn't explain away the type of tank that it is, since it is a flame-throwing tank. Now, in the Justice Department's report, uh, they claim that um, it was they had two CEVs, and they call them CEV one and CEV two, and CEV stands for Combat Engineer Vehicle, and that's kind of a generic name for tank. And in the Justice Department report, they said that they had looked at CEV-1 and CEV-2, and neither one of them were equipped to throw flames. That was to explain away my tape. What they don't mention is that on page 59 of the Justice Department report, it says very plainly that CEV-2 broke down and the tank crew went and got another tank. Now, that's what they're trying to do to explain this tank away. Uh -huh. But they don't address the fact that the tank that's <coughs> brought in shoots flames. Yeah, well, a combat engineering vehicle, Linda, is uh, is something uh, that looks, uh, it's armored, it's big, it looks like a tank, but it's capable of taking a tank in tow and, uh, and is supposed to carry the necessary maintenance equipment to be able to fix another armored vehicle. What we see clearly in there is a tank with a turret with a gun barrel on that turret, and the turret is turned around so that the gun barrel is facing toward the rear of the tank, away from the portion of the tank that's actually going into the building. Now, for the last three days, I've been watching that tape, and Carolyn can verify this uh, for anybody who, who wants to know, if you want to call in or something. Um, in fact, she's sitting right here. For the last three days, once I begin to hear these things from everybody, I have actually been sitting in front of a TV monitor for over eight hours each day, including today, studying every single inch of that film. And I discovered something else that I hadn't seen before. As the tank is going into the building, just uh, as and as it pulls out, and you can see the flame on the front of the tank, there are two men lying on the roof above. There are two guys on the roof. And that's one that's of them, right. I've got, I now have the footage for when they get off the roof. And they are wearing black uniforms and hoods. Yep, they've got, and one of them has a rifle that you can see. Yeah, now I've never saw it before because I was always looking at the front of the tank for the flames. So I never even looked up there. And we thought it was one guy and a hole in the roof, but once we got some stills made of this thing, the silhouettes of the guy's heads turn up perfectly, so we keep looking, and now I've found this other, i found footage that's continuous footage in places that we didn't have it before, because you got, the problem with this thing is, they were not broadcasting this live like they claimed, they really were on a time delay, and different stations cut out different pieces. So you have to go and find as many pieces of the tape as you can from all these different sources to find a continuous segment of footage for any one scene. And so now we found where this, we, you, you've seen on my tape where the one guy jumps off the roof and walks off. He's one of those two guys. Uh -huh. And then the other guy jumps off just before he does. He's over in the corner. Uh, when that guy's up on the roof and jumps off, the other guy is over on the very corner and jumps off, and there was a tank that had come up to both of them uh, just before that, and we've got the footage. I'll put that in the update tape because you can see them both on the roof later as the tank comes up to them, uh -huh. and I think that tank lets somebody else out. We've got more footage that shows agents in and out of this house. We've got a piece of footage that shows a tank spearing somebody, 
and dragging them out through the wall, on, you know, speared on the tank. Whoa, wait a minute. That's it's gory. Wait, wait, back, back up a little bit. Now, let's uh, say this again, Linda. All right. The tank that knocked the corner of the house off, uh -huh. which I think most people got to see that part of the tank knocking this right-hand corner of the house off. Uh-huh. If you're looking at the front door, the right-hand corner of the house has got a big chunk out of it, and you saw the tank do that. What you didn't see was before it knocked that corner off, and this is where I can prove CNN has doctored their footage and not released the whole thing, even when they were claiming to broadcast live, is there is footage before that, and what that tank did was it speared somebody when it went into the house. It speared him, and it backs out with a, and it looks like it's an agent, not a Branch Davidian, because the person is wearing one of those hoods in a black suit. The, it, it, the body is just speared on this tank gun, and the, the tank goes back into the house and knocks this guy's body off by rubbing the tank gun up against the house, and that's how the corner of the house got broken off, was they were wiping this guy's body off like you'd wipe a bug off your shoe. Wow. And it's, you can see the body fall, and you can also see agents run up under the tank and into the hole that was just made by the tank. And there's another scene that we got that shows an agent up very early, way before the fire, up near that same corner of the house. Uh, you know how you would wind up a garden hose in your hand? Uh -huh. Well, he's doing that with some kind of hosing that's up there by the corner of the house. And, and they've never mentioned anything about hoses or, you know, at all. Hoses? Yeah, some kind of hose, and he's not at all afraid of being shot, and this is very early, you know, way before the fire. Yeah, how do you know it's not an electrical cord or something? Well, it could be, it's, it, he's, it, but it, what he's doing is going through the gestures of, just like when you wind up your garden hose, he's standing there doing that with something. Or, or a data cord. Yeah, it could be anything, you know, but it's some kind of, of, of a hose or a cord or whatever that he's wrapping up. And the other thing is, this camera angle that this guy had, it's, it's a satellite feed, and it's over kind of towards the, um, let's see. You, you know, I haven't seen any of this footage that oh, you're you talking about. Oh, you have seen it, and I'll be glad to make it. Well, I'm going to make an update tape with it. At the south end of the house, where the underground tunnel was, there's footage from that that I had never seen, and there's these orange blobs, or can, they look like, uh, just, they look like body bags is what they look like. You know how they covered these people in these yellowish-orange things uh -huh. when they were taking the bodies out? Yeah. These things are all over the place at the back side of the house, and, and I had never seen those before, because you never get that camera angle. We don't know what they are, but you can see several of them. Well, we, we had reports from, uh, well, not reports, we had one report from someone who claims that he was hiding in the in the the brush and woods back there and watching the back of the house and he said that branch Davidians ran out of the back of the house and as they ran out they were shot and killed as they were trying to escape out the back of course where there were no TV cameras now I've never talked about this because we could never verify it and I'm going to tell you right now folks if you're listening this is unverified we we do not count as legitimate um, information from one source oh, well, I'll tell you what has my back that source up a little bit is there was a barn behind the house and I have pictures of this and one of my pictures is in the Jubilee this month of the barn <coughs> Uh, that the FBI rescue, hostage rescue team had set up. They had sandbags all inside this barn, and they punched holes in the wall for the snipers to shoot out of. And that was behind the house, and I got pictures of that. So they definitely did have snipers back there that could shoot at anybody that came out. And another thing that um, you can see this on my tape, and I didn't know it. Somebody just pointed it out to me the other day. There's a scene where when, we, when the lady is saying they were not knocking small holes to inject tear gas. They were destroying the end of the house. Uh -huh. The camera pans then, and you can see uh, just before it, the camera stops on the crushed end of the house, look at the back end there. The whole gymnasium is gone. It has been totally destroyed, and that is the garbage that you're seeing all piled up there before the camera stops. If you look at some of the earlier scenes and compare it, they completely obliterated already that back end of the house. Uh -huh. And I never realized that but it, until somebody pointed it out to me. Everybody that watches the tape footage sees more things. And 
Well, I've seen a lot more that I haven't even talked about yet. <laughs> Just I spent three days, eight hours a day, in front of this monitor watching every single inch of well, that. Well, I've been doing yeah. for months, and you see, you're just looking at a few little snippets, and you're seeing, you know, probably hundreds of things that are important. Picture having several hundred hours of this footage, and all of it has something. And do you realize not one of these so-called independent investigators has asked to see any of this footage? None of them. And I've called Janet Reno's office and talked to a fellow that it, she brought with her from Florida that I assume uh -huh. is, you know, someone that would tell her, and told them what we had. And his attitude was pretty much, uh, well, tell the FBI. Tell somebody who cares. You know? <laughs> and, like, I'm going to tell the FBI when it's the FBI we're talking about. Yeah. That's who did this. Well, uh, I want to uh, tell you that we do have um, quite a bit of the footage that was on the KU band that nobody's seen. The reason I was spending so much time in front of your film is because the controversy was over your film, and they were making uh, direct accusations uh, about your film. So I was trying to uh, correlate this or, or disprove it or find out what was true or what was false, as I always do with everything. And uh, what I discovered is um, is there's no way um, that anybody can say that that uh, is or is not a flame. It looks like a flame to me, and I believe that it is a flame. And uh, if anybody uh, says that it's not a flame, I can tell you right now there's no way in this world that they're going to be able to prove that. You can see something hanging off the end of the tank. Uh, but what you see there is the flame doesn't look like a reflection off of whatever's hanging off the end of the tank. It looks like a flame that's uh, in front of uh, whatever that is hanging off. Say on the VHS it, copies, what you don't realize, when you see something that looks like it's mashing down the flame, it's not junk mashing down the flame, it's smoke. And the flame and the smoke are both being blown down by the wind. And you can see that a little better on the three-quarter inch copy. You should have that. Have you looked at that? Oh, yours got eaten. Mine okay, got, got eaten. Send you another one. But what you can't, what I realize you can't see that doesn't come out very clearly on the VHS tapes is the smoke. And the smoke itself is what conclusively proves you're seeing fire uh -huh. rather than a curtain or insulation because reflections and curtains don't make smoke. Also, folks, i got to tell you, my master tape was on three-quarter inch, and it got eaten by the tape machine. And so what I've been watching is the, is the original VHS tape that Linda uh, sent me a long, long time ago, which is not even, not even close to the quality of the master tape that got eaten. So, uh, as soon as you get another master, step that through a machine and see what else you can see, because you can see a lot of detail in the um, three-quarter inch copies that you, that you lose when it goes to VHS, because VHS is such a poor quality. Yeah, I know that. And I, I didn't know any of this when we started making videos, but when you make a copy, it gets worse and worse each copy that you make on a VCR. Yeah, each generation. And you lose a lot of quality. That's correct. But we've got all this tape available, you know, in good quality copies that the investigators could look at, and they turn their noses up at it, and we've got com clear, convincing proof that these guys murdered the Branch Davidians with a flamethrowing tank. Now, why won't they look at this tape? Why won't they look at this footage? Why don't they have a real investigation? Who's covering it up and who's involved? We know. It goes all the way to Clinton. Well, it goes, it goes to a lot of strange places, which we're going to talk about in the second half hour. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's, it's incredible what we're finding out, and uh, what we're going to be talking about in the second half hour, folks, is going to just blow your mind. Uh, and we, So stay tuned. Don't you dare move away from that radio. And uh, I've got to uh, take a short break here in just, uh, just a couple of seconds. But uh, what we're discovering here is, is that this is way beyond what anybody can possibly conceive of uh, right now. Anybody out there that's telling you that they know what this is all about is, is pumping you up full of baloney. Nobody really knows what this is all about. We have a lot of clues. Uh, we've traced it to a lot of people and a lot of things that have happened, and uh, what we found out is going to blow your mind, and uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is incredible, and uh, we're going to continue in the second half hour. Stand by, Linda. Up from the coldest and darkest regions of the sea, as old as time itself, comes the most terrifying monster the world has ever seen. The Sea 
slithering over the face of the earth came a monster from beyond the stars. Inhuman, indestructible. Life on this planet was doomed when it conquered the world. These will be the strangest, most terrifying motion pictures you have ever seen. You will see monsters from a nightmare. The most horrifying creatures that ever made you wake up screaming. Ah! Oh, she creature! And it's... Well, you put all these uh, so-called patriots in this country to shame... Linda, and I'm proud to walk with you, not just for a ways, but for the whole mile if we have to. I'd take you up the river with me any time, and uh, I was a river patrol boat captain in Vietnam, and that's, that's a lot to say for somebody from somebody like me who's gone up the river. Now, uh, we've just found something out. We're going to reveal it for the first time tonight. Well, I want to say one thing. You sure did nail the guys that were going to turn out to be the uh, turncoats in this thing early on. And I was skeptical, and, but I can't say you didn't warn me, that's for sure. Yeah. And everybody that you have pinpointed, you have turned out to be 100% right. Well, I, I, uh, I, I don't like to be right about things like that, but unfortunately it is right. And you did. You, uh, Boy, you grilled me and you raked me over the coals. And uh, there was a few times when you just flat told me that I was full of crap. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> So, uh, but you found out yourself. Um, but uh, let me break this this story right now because the Kaji people have been going full blown into this. We have investigators all over the country looking into Waco. We had people on site when Waco was happening, as you all know, all of you who listen to this show all the time. What we have found, ladies and gentlemen, is that during the years that MK Ultra was being conducted by the Central Intelligence Agency. The Seventh-day Adventist Church furnished volunteers for mind control experiments under Project MK Ultra. Now, this went on for many, many years. We also know that Jim Jones was connected with MK Ultra, along with a whole bunch of other uh, strange things. Uh, now, I can tell you right now that that uh, David Koresh and uh, uh, Mark Bro were both connected to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. We've been able to connect these people directly to Lewis, Lewis Jolyon West, who is a professor uh, at the Neuropsychological Institute at UCLA. Oh, actually, he's not. He was just relieved for embezzlement. Oh, he just uh, left. Okay, so he's not. Uh, he was also one of the prime uh, doctors uh, in connection with Project MK Ultra, along with a lot of other people, uh, including Barry Taff, who's a frequent writer for UFO Magazine and who actually set Vicki Cooper, the publisher of UFO Magazine, up with an apartment uh, uh, and didn't even know her when she arrived in Los Angeles after uh, uh, coming under the, the witness uh, protection program after blowing the whistle on the Mayflower Madam. This, this thing goes all over the place. And when David Casalero was talking about an octopus, we here at Kaji are beginning to know exactly what this guy was talking about. And uh, coincidentally, he was writing a book that he was going to name Behold a Pale Horse, which is the same name that, that my book is called. So we all have an understanding of this that goes much deeper than most of you may understand or, or realize. Uh, this whole thing is very strange. We know that David Koresh went to Israel where he studied the Talmud. We have information from sources that while he was there, he was trained by the Jewish Defense League in infantry tactics. Not just him, but him and uh, a couple of his, uh, his followers, men, and uh, that they came back to the United States. And uh, so this is not just about some little drug lab that used to be on the property that the Branch Davidians occupied, although it may have something to do with the ultimate outcome. We've also found out that there was a tunnel leading from the, uh, the house of the Branch Davidians down to a little dam across a, a, a drainage ditch, uh, which could have been used as an entrance and an exit way. And talking to some of his family members, apparently during the siege, 
somebody used this to enter and leave uh, what they call the compound, the church uh, area. Uh, we also know that on the Linda Thompson film, you can see agents with their hands in the air backing away from this same draining di drainage ditch, backing away, not away from the Branch Davidian buildings, but away from the end of the tunnel toward the Branch Davidian buildings. Now, you know, watching this like everybody else did, I didn't understand which way they were backing until I began to really study the film and the layout of this uh, this property. What have you got to say about all this, Linda? Well, it gets curiouser and curiouser and deeper and deeper. We've got the connections that you just pointed out to uh, the MK Ultra project, and I was working on that from a completely different perspective and pretty much came up with all the same things you came up with. I had heard originally that maybe this whole thing was a mind control experiment, and I just scoffed it off. I thought, oh, man, that's out there with the loonies, you know. I'll, that, I put that definitely aside as a possibility. And in checking this out, it all returns to that probability now rather than possi impossibility because this Lewis Jolly and West was and is an experimenter for the CIA. He's written 12 different papers that I've found so far on brainwashing, mind control, and cults. And he has experimented with implants into people's brains, LSD and hypnosis, uh, brainwashing techniques, and being able to manipulate people through different types of sound waves and microwaves that are, can be pinpointed to portions of the brain to make you respond in a specific way, passively or actively, for instance. So there, And he was one of the consulting experts during the Branch Davidian siege. Yeah, that's now, very... It's just the very fact that he was even around makes me wonder why. Really? You know, why was he around? And then why did we have a British spy plane brought in? Why was there this international involvement? Why do we have the guy who was um, the so-called detective uh, following them around for two and a half years? Why was he hired by the law firm that represents the Mossad? And why was Cult Awareness Network involved in this and using as their experts people such as Lewis West, jo Lewis Jolly and West, he's called Jolly West, terrible nickname if I ever heard one. For him, um, yes. The, the great mind control experimental. That's a direct connection between Cult Awareness Network and the CIA, and we know that the ADL right now is being exposed as a covert agency of the CIA, that they gather information on people and groups. So we've got the same little snake's nest again behind everything. Now, why? Why are the, why this particular little group in Waco? What is? Why were they targeted? Why were they so important that they all needed to be killed? That's what was it they were going to reveal to the world that would make them worth killing? Well, maybe they... I don't know if they were going to reveal anything to the world or not, but I will tell you this. It involves much, much more than a bunch of local politicians involved in the methamphetamine lab. It goes all the way uh, around the world. Well, it Some... really does, because just look at the... We've got an Australian connection to this thing. We've got a British connection to this. And we've got an Israeli connection to this. Yes. And we know that several of the people that are claiming to be Branch Davidians are government agents. Now, this is this doesn't make any sense at all <laughs> unless it is international or in scale. It makes no sense that all of these international agencies would be involved in this. Now, there's a tape which, uh, which exists, which is on the way to uh, me as we speak, and as soon as I get it, which will be after uh, my stint in San Mateo sometime, I don't, I don't know exactly when it's going to arrive, on this tape, there's a conversation between uh, one of the sheriff's uh, department personnel and an ATF agent. And uh, during this exchange, the ATF agent says to the sheriff's department personnel that he's going to turn the whole matter over to his partner. And when he turns it over to his partner, the person on the phone is Rita Starling Riddle. So Rita is an agent, too. She was and asked. She was. She was. She was asked point blank about this, and she did not deny it. Nor did she confirm it, but she would not deny it. Well, a number of people are turning out to be agents and operatives, and that's made it much more difficult to get information because everybody asks, 
why aren't the Branch Davidians talking? Why don't they tell us their side of the story? And I think it's because the only people that are real Branch Davidians that were in that place uh, are being kept from talking to anyone. Or maybe dead. And the rest of them are agents. Or maybe dead. Pardon? Or maybe dead. I can't. I, you, you can say it now. I said, or maybe dead. Yes, or dead, yes. Yeah. Now, um... Uh, I want to point out to everybody out there that uh, Rita Riddle has children. And uh, so don't go condemning her. Maybe she is, uh, maybe she did this because uh, her children were threatened. We don't know. And, and during a survival situation, people do strange things. And uh, so all we want to do is get at the truth. We don't want to persecute anybody. We want to get to the truth. And it looks like the truth right now is Rita Starling Riddle was involved with the ATF. Uh, now, there, there's a lot, lot more to this. It, I mean, it just it, it just keeps going and going and going and going and going and doesn't seem to to uh, want to stop. In fact, well, remember Ron Engelman was the radio host that supposedly was communicating with the Branch Davidians while the siege was going on, and he was working with Gary Hunt. You remember the whole premise for Gary Hunt claiming that he had this. Yeah, film? I've got to ask you something. Where did you get that film that? that clip of film in your video of the uh, the funeral scene. That was broadcast over television as it was on a news show as being a scene from the funeral of one of the ATF agents and I knew it couldn't be because if you look at it, the cars in the background are all from the 70s. The clothes on the people, uh, if you look at the women, they're wearing uh, mini skirts with empire waistlines, which even though mini skirts have come back in style a little bit, uh -huh. the empire waist and the top neckline and so forth that this one woman is wearing is definitely not in style. Then they have the bouffant hairdo, which is a lot different than the uh, big hair that you see now. Uh, the bouffant was a specific style. And what I noticed when I first saw that was I recognized one of the men carrying a coffin or the coffin as someone that I was in the Army with, you know, 15 years ago. And, I, and he didn't look like he'd aged. I said, man, he, you know, for 15 years, he, he looks awful good. And then that's what got us looking at that piece of tape a lot, and we realized that can't possibly be the scene from a funeral now. All the cars are from the 70s. Even the cameras that the cameramen have in the background are old-fashioned cameras. And for some reason... The, the station used a piece of film footage that's 15 or 20 years old to portray a funeral for one of the ATS agents. Now, I don't know if they just used it to show a funeral or if it was an intentional misrepresentation, but it also looks like Gary Hunt is one of the people in the back carrying the coffin. Well, we've had eight people make a positive identification that the, that the last person on the far side holding the, the casket is Gary Hunt. Well, that's why I went ahead and put it in. Now that, had been shown. that person also matches the photograph that Gary Hunt sent us for his press credentials, which he ultimately stole from us, and we believe are probably in the ATF files. Now, something else is really strange about that clip, because uh, except for Gary Hunt, the one who has been identified as Gary Hunt, the other men carrying that casket all have Hitler mustaches, every one single thing, one of them. One thing I thought about that, though, is they could be military mustaches because they have to cut their mustaches no, those off are, right at the top of the lip and at the outside edges of the lip. No, that's the exact same mustache that Hitler wore, and it doesn't look like real hair. It looks like it's been drawn in like with a mascara picture right under their nose to make them all look like Nazis. And uh, if you took that directly off of a television broadcast, then somebody's really playing with our minds. I mean, I'll have to go back and look at that. Oh, I've studied it for three days. You go back and look at it. All you people out there who have the, the uh, Waco the Big Lie, go back and start looking at that film with a fine-tooth comb, and you're going to see things that you... Did. I know that I put that film footage in because it was so bizarre to me. That I, I recognized one of the guys, you know, from 15 years ago, and then recognized Hunt, too, because, of course, I've seen Hunt, and I didn't want to claim it was Hunt you know, without having anybody else authenticate that for me, but it sure looked like Hunt to me. It looks exactly like the photographs he sent us for his press credentials. We've had CADGI members uh, show the uh, the video to people who know Gary Hunt, and eight different people have positively identified that man as Gary Hunt. Well, while, I, while we're on the air, if anyone has ever seen Ron Engelman and Gary Hunt at the same time, 
I'd like to know that, too, because uh, the one piece of film I have that shows somebody that's supposed to be Ron Engelman looks an awful lot like Hunt, too. So I don't know. Well, uh, I want you all to understand that uh, I don't, I, I don't um, have anything uh, bad to say about Ron Engelman. I know Linda doesn't either. Uh, and all during the Waco siege, Ron Engelman was on the radio trying to tell the world what was happening. But there's some strange things going on. And, well, why, uh, would he, why would Ron Engelman say he had proof and then admit to me that he had not had the film analyzed and admit to me that he had never seen this other piece of tape footage and that it, he didn't have any proof at all, and yet he was announcing already that he was going to go on, t on the radio and say that, that he did? I have now, no that's very, very strange. It is strange, but it's not uh, its not something you can condemn somebody for. Maybe some of his friends or maybe somebody that he respected uh, talked him into believing it without, without seeing it, uh, which nobody should ever do. But uh, we don't know. We just don't know. It's just, it is strange, like you say. Well, I do know another thing, that they both, uh, Tom Donahue and Ron Engelman, were angry that uh, you and I had identified Bo Grites as being the turncoat that he is. <laughs> and I know that that was one of the things that precipitated what they were doing, because they were mad at me for for um, saying that. You know, because Bo Grice attacked me, and the, the things that he used to attack me were were blatant were, were blatant lies, most of yeah, them. Yeah, absolutely. Because, for instance, he initially claimed I had no military experience, and then he claimed to correct this in his last newsletter by saying, well, I had high school ROTC. <laughs> well, I didn't have high school ROTC. I've never been in ROTC at all. I was active Army from 1974 to 1978. I was assistant to the commanding general of Allied Forces Central Europe, and I revised the NATO war plans manuals, and I had a cosmic top secret atomic clearance, and after that, I was in the reserves until 1987. So I think I have more than, uh, you know, a little high school ROTC. And as a fact of the matter is, before he put that out, I had called him on the phone, giving him the benefit of the doubt, thinking that he was simply mistaken in the information that he'd been given. I told him the correct information. He agreed with me that he was not going to continue that, and yet he turned right around and he did it again. And he also made the same claim that the flames on the tank are insulation, and he also claimed that there's no reason for concern about these black helicopters or the U.N. troop movements in this country. <laughs> and I think there's a great deal of concern. The black helicopters at this point have been photographed by people all over the country. It's not isolated. We've actually located several places where these things are parked. I was just in Milwaukee this past weekend. 3,000 people, by the way, showed up to see the tape in Milwaukee. And a fellow there took us out and showed us the inside building where the black helicopters are parked in Milwaukee. And that's the fifth place I have personally seen where these black helicopters are. I've personally seen the helicopters over my house, over my office, over two shopping malls, and down at Waco. Now, the black helicopters are part of what appears to be this multi-jurisdictional task force that's referred to in a public law Public Law 100-690. It's in my book. Everybody who's read my book has read all about the multi-jurisdictional task force. Yeah, so for them to say that it doesn't exist is absurd in the extreme. And the other thing that I was attacked on was not, it was they claimed that I didn't have any proof that the three guys killed in Waco were Clinton's bodyguards. Well, you don't get much better proof than Clinton himself naming them by name and saying that they were members of his presidential security which is exactly where I got the information. It was from a speech that Bill Clinton made on March the 18th to the Treasury Department, and he named these agents by name that were killed in Waco, and he said they'd been members of his security. And that you, you know something? Uh, with all the inaccuracies and all the lies and all the BS and the books that Bogreitz has written, which reveal absolutely nothing, tell no one anything, now, the stuff he's telling is a matter of public record. It's in the congressional record. He must he, he must have been the greatest greatest inept, uh, totally incompetent intelligence agent that ever existed in this world. Well, I know that I have been absolutely shocked at the viciousness of the attacks on me by him because I've only met him once. That was in Loudonville. That was set up by somebody connected to him. Because otherwise, I would have never mentioned him, never met him, never, and I would never have said anything bad about him at all. 
know, uh, I well, wouldn't I know you wouldn't. In, in, period. I had no reason to. In fact, you were very upset with me when I told you that Bogreitz was, in fact, a Trojan horse, according to our investigations. Uh, and, yeah, and that was one of the, because I didn't have any proof of that, and I knew there was a schism in the patriot community where half the people think he's a Trojan horse and the other half think he's, you know, a saint. Linda, let me tell you something. There is no schism. There is no patriot community. There oh. isn't any. There are no patriot organizations. There are patriots in this country. But anybody who believes there's a patriot community and that there are patriot leaders controlling patriot organizations is going to regret it in the long run, I can assure you. These people, with their Hegelian uh, political conflict resolution uh, methods, control both sides of every conflict, and I can tell you right now that that's exactly what's going on. Well, how do we organize a real patriot community, then? Because that's, we've got to do that. You can't. We've simply got to do that. These people have spent their lives learning how to infiltrate and control organizations. You can't. That's why I'm trying to wake people up, empower them, teach them that they don't need leaders if they use their own head, how to form local units with people they've known all their life who have no connection to anything, secret society, government, intelligence community, or otherwise, and operate on their local level to clean this mess up. And we can do it that way. But if you think you're going to go down and, and join some big patriot group like the John Birch Society or the uh, Council for Domestic Relations or any of these things, uh, you're, you're foolish. Yeah. I, well, that's for sure as far as the infiltrators go because we've seen that time and again. All these organizations do is keep patriots running around in circles chasing their own tail. They never identify the enemy. They never deal with the enemy. They never do anything that's worthwhile. They never, ever win the battle. That's true. Now, so to turn the battle around, what are individual groups supposed to do? Buy Gannett Company Incorporated stock and uh, get ready. <laughs> We're buying a major news media corporation. The listeners of the hour of the time and everybody else who's interested, we're buying stock. The New York Stock Exchange symbol is GCI. They're turning their proxy vote over to me. I'm going to go to the stockholders meeting. I'm going to tell them what we want the company to do from now on. If they want to do it, they can keep their jobs. If they don't want to do it, we'll fire them all and put people in who will. And we're going to, tell, we're going to tell the nation the truth. How and they, we can't buy up all the AP stuff? And they won't be able to infiltrate us or control us because there is no organization. I don't get anybody's stock certificates. Nobody pays me any money. But I may end up as the chairman of the board again at Company Incorporated. Huh, that's a neat approach. So that's what we're going to do. And Linda, I want to thank I like you. <laughs> I, want to, I want to thank you for being our very special guest tonight. We're out of time. For everybody out there listening, remember I'll be at the Dunphy Hotel, San Mateo, California. Uh, for information, call 415-905-8874. That's 415-905-8874. And if you're wondering what, what exactly to do about all this stuff, folks, I want you to just listen to this. Good night, and God bless you all.